Thank you. So as Ian's already said, uh, my name's Katie Miller or Code Miller on Twitter and I'm a developer at Red Hat. Uh, so today I'm here to talk to you about Monads, but before I get onto that, I want to find out a little bit about you. Who has heard the term Monad or Monad, as some people say, before today? Okay, most people, good. Who would say that they'd feel comfortable explaining what a Monad is to another person? No? <laughs> All right, a couple? Oh, okay, good thing I'm here then. So, <laughs> Monads are an abstraction, and like most abstract concepts, people have found dozens of different ways to explain them. If you troll the internet for monad tutorials, you'll find out that monads are burritos, spacesuits, love affairs, monsters, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so I've lured you here today saying that I'm going to explain that monads are superheroes, but I don't really want to add this to that long list of analogies, at least not in the sense of trying to explain every detail about how monads work in terms of superheroes. Instead, I'm using the comparison to theme and structure today's talk. And I've chosen superheroes for a few reasons. Firstly, because superheroes are awesome, and it gave me a legitimate excuse to use a hero generator, which you'll see the results of in a minute. Um, secondly, monads seem to have this reputation as being scary. And I want to emphasize that they're really not. Monads are a good thing. And finally, I've chosen the comparison because it captures the four different areas that I want to talk about today. So here we have a definition of superhero. Like superheroes, monads are found in a particular setting, and we're going to find out what that is. Monads also have a very distinctive costume, and we're going to look at what that is. Thirdly, as I've already said, monads are not the villain here. They are a good thing. Sometimes people explain what monads are, but not necessarily why you would use them. So I want to have a look at that. And finally, like superheroes, monads have some special, possibly unexpected abilities. We're going to find out what those are. So with that in mind, uh, I give you your guide today, Monad Man. And the four areas we're going to look at, context, costume, purpose, and powers. So every superhero has to have a particular setting or context. Monads come from mathematics, from category theory. Uh, but the monads I'm going to be talking to you about today are from the realm of programming. And monads can be found uh, in all styles of programming, a very common pattern, but they're especially prevalent in functional programming. I'm just going to start out briefly by looking at what functional programming is all about. There we go. So, what's functional programming? So it's a programming paradigm, so it's not limited to any particular language, where the fundamental operation is the application of functions to arguments. So we're all familiar with functions from mathematics, right? Like, say, addition. It takes two arguments and it returns their sum. Now, as a pure function, when you call this function um, with the same results, or the same arguments, sorry, you're going to get the same result every time because it doesn't have any side effects. It doesn't do anything other than use the arguments that you gave it to give you back the result. Uh, and so knowing that we're able to get the same result every time we pass in the same arguments gives rise to a property we call referential transparency. And this means that we can replace an expression in code that's calling one of these pure functions with its value without affecting the behavior of the program in any way. And this turns out to be a very good thing. Uh, we also generally have functions that are first class. And this just means that functions are values, like any other values in your language. And they can be passed around the same way. And we also generally have functions that are higher order, which means they either take other functions as arguments or return them as a result. So here are a few uh, features you might see in functional programs. We've got immutable data, lazy evaluation, lambdas and closures, pattern matching, alternatives to loops, and by that I mean uh, functions like map, filter, and fold, which ho hopefully you may have heard of before, and finally partial application and currying. So rather than going through definitions for all of those, I'm going to show them to you as part of an example. Uh, today I'm going to be using Haskell and Java 8 code examples. Who's familiar with Haskell syntax? Anyone? Oh, fair few. Okay, that's good. So for those of you who aren't, um, this example is to bring you up to speed. So start out here, uh, we're just binding uh, a variable to a name. And because we're talking immutable data, so once you've done this, my list is always going to have that value. And the value here is a single element list. This is Haskell's list syntax. Uh, so the element is the string A. And at the end of the line here, we've got two dashes. That's Haskell's comment syntax. And the comment there is just letting us know that really this is syntactic sugar 
for this. So lists are structured uh, this way. So the colon there is the function cons, and cons takes a value, in this case the string A, and a list, in this case an empty list. So our single element list is structured this way. And it's going to be useful for us to think about lists this way for the rest of the talk. Um, so all lists are either made up this way, it's a recursive definition, um, with the rest of your list, what's being cons onto, or it's an empty list. There are only two options. Second thing we've got here is a function definition. So we've got the name of our function, my func, and then it's type. So what's all this stuff going on here? Before this double arrow, um, we've got what are known as class constraints. So these are kind of like interfaces in a language like Java. They define some behavior. So in the rest of the signature, we've got a type A. Here, we're being told that A has to be something that's an instance of the num and the enum type classes. So that's telling us that A has to be something that acts like a number and that's enumerable. We're just defining some behavior there. After that, we've got our actual arguments and what's returned. And the way you can read this is that whatever comes last is what ends up being returned. So here, this is a list of tuples or pairs of some type A and some type B. So these are type variables. That could be an int, a string, or, or whatever else. Uh, and it takes two arguments, this function, a list of some type B and an int, and returns that. And the reason it's written uh, with the arrows this way is because all functions in Haskell actually only take a single argument. So the more correct way to read this is that it takes some list of B and returns a function which takes an int and returns a list of tuples. But generally, as an approximation, we just say it's a function that takes two arguments. Uh, on the second line here, we've got the actual implementation of our function here. So we've got the name of it again, and then we've got our arguments. So we're naming our arguments here like you normally would. So the n is our int that's being passed in. And this business here is an example of pattern matching. So this is going to be our list, but we're matching on the structure of it. So the x is going to be bound to the head of the list and the xs to the rest of the list. So it's worth noting that this pattern won't match an empty list. And after the equal sign, we've got the actual um, body of our function. And we're just calling another function, in this case, fold r. Who's heard of fold? Perhaps known as reduce in some languages, yeah? OK, so I'll go through a little example so you can see how fold works. Um, but here's its signature in Haskell. So it ends up returning some type b, and it takes three things. It takes a list to fold over of some type a, uh, a b, which is we call the starting value of what's the accumulator and some function that takes an A, so something from that list, and the B, the accumulator, and returns a B. So what it's doing is going uh, through the list and folding a function between each of the elements of that list and reducing it into one value. And if that sounds, doesn't make too much sense, hopefully it will make more sense when I show you an example. So up here, we've got fold R followed by its three arguments, and function application in Haskell is a space, so there's no brackets here or anything going on. These are the three arguments. The first argument here is an example of a lambda, so this is an anonymous function. Um, so after the slash there, we've got the two arguments coming in, an i, which is going to be an element of the list, and ac, which is going to be our accumulator, and then it's returning a tuple of i, comma, x, cons onto the rest of the list. So we're building up a list of results. Where did x come from? Well, that was defined over here. And because a closure is formed when this is evaluated, we're able to access things that are defined outside that lambda. The empty list here is our starting value for our accumulator. And at the end, we have an example of a lazy evaluation. So these square brackets with the one dot dot is an infinite list. That's an infinite list of integers. Doesn't cause a problem, though, because we only evaluate the part of it that we need. And that's going to be the first n elements. That's what take is doing here. So let's have a look at an example. This is going to work. There we go. Um, so one way of thinking about fold is that it replaces each of the cons cons is in a list when it's written in its cons form with the function that you're folding over it and replaces the empty list with whatever the accumulator is. So we'll actually do that. So we're calling my func with the list we defined at the top and the number three. So we need a list, one, two, three. That's the first three from the infinite list of integers. And so here we go. We've done that re uh, replacement. There's our function. And the empty list uh, is still the empty list because it's the same as our starting value for our accumulator. Now, this is fold r because it's right associative. And to make that obvious, I've just put in some brackets so you can see how this is evaluated. So starting on the right here, we have this function. So the i becomes 3, and the act becomes our empty list. So when that's evaluated, we get a tuple 3a. Now we're evaluating the 2 with that function and the accumulator we've built up. 
and so we get the list 2A, 3A, and then finally oop, with the 1, and so we get 1A, 2A, 3A. So hopefully that gives you some idea of fold R and how it works. It's going to be used in some of the other slides today. Secondly, Java 8. So I'm going to assume most people are familiar with a Java or Java-like syntax, but you may not be familiar with what's coming in Java 8. So these are a couple of interfaces uh, that are going to be built in. Uh, so we've got function, and the significant method there is apply. So we set take some t, any type t, and return an r. And we've also got by function, which is the same kind of thing, but with two arguments. So we take two arguments and return some result r. So how can you use this? Here's an example of a map function. So we're taking in a list of integers, a function that maps from integers to integers, and we're just going through and applying that function to every element in the list, building up a list of results. Why is this cool? Well, now in Java 8, we can do things like this. We've got some list. Now, instead of having to create some anonymous inner class or whatnot of function, we've got lambda expressions. So we can just say, take some i, return i plus 1. We run that, 1, 2, 3 becomes, as expected, 2, 3, 4. So there's a couple of things I should mention about the code that you're going to see on the slides today. Uh, the Haskell is a little bit more verbose than idiomatic Haskell, just to make it easier to digest. And the Java is a little less verbose um, than Java, just to make it easier to digest. <laughs> I've had to remove a few casts and things. Um, as this syntax will be new to a lot of you, um, don't stress too much if you don't follow every single line of code. Where emphasis is on the ideas here today. But all of the code and more is on GitHub, so you can walk through it later. And in fact, I'd encourage you to do so, because some of these concepts take some time to sink in. So finally, why would you program in this style? Well, there's lots of reasons. Uh, here are just a few. And to me, the big ticket items there are the ability to reason about your program behavior. You can actually do equational reasoning on your code. And secondly, more modular programs. We know, all know modularity is a very good thing. So that's the context we're talking about. Now let's move on to monads and what they look like or what costume it is that they wear. So a monad is a structure that puts values in some sort of computational context. And we're going to see some examples shortly of what that context could be. And to be a monad, these structures have to implement two particular functions. First one is return, also sometimes called unit or pure. Uh, and return has a signature, and this is just pseudocode, no particular language, something like this. It takes a type, uh, some type A, a value of some type A, and returns a monad of that type A. So it's able to take the value and put it in the monadic context, whatever that may be. And in fact, the minimal monadic context that will still yield that same value. The second important function here is bind, uh, which you might have heard called select many in the .NET world or flat map. Uh, so it takes two things. It takes a monad of some type A, a function that takes one of something of that type A and returns a monad of some type B and returns a monad of type B. So just kind of looking at the signature there, you can kind of see what's going on. Um, the bind is somehow able to extract the value of type A from the monad that's passed in and apply this function to it to give us the monad of type B. So to kind of uh, illustrate that, let's imagine we had a type, it's a char, and we've got a particular value S, return, would put that in some kind of context. In this case, we use the context of a superhero insignia. Our bind function would take one of those values in one of those contexts, manage to extract the value out of it, do some kind of transformation on it, and return the transformed value back in one of those contexts. Or to put that picture into words, any time you start with something which you pull apart and use to compute something of that same type, you have a monad. And as Daniel goes on to say here, it's a pattern you see everywhere. This is really, really common. So here are a few examples of particular monads you might see. That was the abstract idea. Uh, but you might be interested to know that list can be a monad. So its computational context is that it uh, represents multiple values at the same time. That's the idea of non-determinism. We also have the maybe an option monad. It's another very common one. And it represents that a value may or may not actually be present. Some people like to look at maybe as a list that has either zero or one element. Zero if a value wasn't present, or one if it was. So we have uh, monads that uh, contain zero or more values, like a list, or zero or one elements, like maybe. But we also have monads that do completely different things, like uh, reading an environment, such as the reader monad, or reading and updating an environment, like the state monad. 
So although we're going to be focusing in on list and maybe monads today, which are actually fairly similar, just keep in the back of your mind that uh, this pattern can be applied to all kinds of different things and they're not necessarily all quite like these examples. It's also worth mentioning uh, that the way that monads wear their costume of bind and return has to follow particular laws. So yes, there is a fashion police. Um, I'm not going to go through these uh, laws today because they are actually fairly intuitive, but if you were implementing your own monad, you'd want to make sure that these laws hold. So let's delve in now and see how we might implement those bind and return functions for the maybe monad. So I've already mentioned that maybe represents possible failure, possible failure to find a, a value. So this is commonly used uh, in place of returning null. So other languages might return null. In Haskell, you'd return a maybe type instead to represent the fact that there may or may not be a value there. And maybe is a built-in type in Haskell. I've just got this at the top here to show you how it's declared to give you some idea. Um, so this part before the equal sign is a type constructor. So maybe by itself isn't a type. It takes a type, so that's kind of like a generic if you like. So you can have a maybe int or a maybe string or whatnot. Uh, after the equal sign, we've got the two data constructors, the two ways that you can make one of these types. So you can either have a nothing, which doesn't take any uh, type variable, or a just something, whatever it might be. So if we're going to implement this return type, we want to take some type A, it can be anything, and we want to return a maybe of that type A. How are we going to do that? Well, we can just use the constructor just uh, to put that into the maybe context. So for example, if we had run return maybe on seven, we'd get back just seven. So now it's not just an ordinary seven, it's a seven in the maybe context. What about bind? For bind, we're going to want to take a maybe A, a function that takes an A and returns a maybe B, and somehow apply it to get a maybe B. So how are we going to get the value out um, so we can apply a function to it? Well, we can use pattern matching. So we've got two implementations here in whichever uh, pattern matches will be used. So if our maybe passed in is a nothing, when we bind it to a function, and I've used bind in the infix position here, it's what the back ticks mean, um, just because that's how bind is more commonly used, uh, we return nothing. There's no sensible way to apply a function to nothing other than returning nothing. Whereas if we have a just something, then we want to take that something and just apply that function f to it, which we know gives us a maybe b, which is what we want to return. So we've fulfilled our signature there. So for example, Let's say we had just seven bound to a little anonymous function here that takes some value x, adds one to it, and then puts it back in the maybe context. So that matches our signature above. So just seven is going to become just eight. If we bound that same function to nothing, we're going to get nothing as expected. And yes, you can chain these things together. So if we had just seven bound to our same function before, from before, and then bound the result of that to another function that multiplies the value by five and puts it back in that maybe context, then just seven becomes just eight, becomes just 40. What about in Java? Well, it's gonna take me three slides rather than one to show you the Java implementation, um, but we can do this in Java. So we've got an abstract class here maybe of some generic type A. So our bind is gonna take a function, that's that interface we saw before, that takes an A to a maybe B, and we're going to return a maybe b, and we're calling it on a maybe a, so we don't need to pass that in in this case. Uh, in terms of return, we're going to use the idiomatic Java way and use constructors. So if we want a nothing, we're just going to have a method that gives us a nothing. If we want a something, we'll have a just that takes in a value and constructs one of these justs, and I'll show you that class in a second. And finally, in Java, we do have a null, so it's going to be useful to have a uh, method like this that takes something when we don't know whether it's null or not. If it's null, gives us a nothing, otherwise adjust something. So our nothing class uh, is going to implement bind similar to what we saw in Haskell. We're just going to return a nothing. There's nothing else sensible we could return. Our just class is going to take in that value and it's going to store it in a field and storing it as final. So we're using that principle of immutable data here. When we do bind, we're going to take in our function and simply just apply it to that value, which we have access to because it's a field on the class. And just to give you some idea uh, of how this looks and why it's attractive, so here's that same logic we had before, taking in a maybe, adding one, and multiplying it by five. Here's how you might do it uh, in Java the ordinary way, checking for null all the time, because you don't have that context encoded there, so you're never sure whether or not something is going to be null. So you can see 
um, but this structure just gives you much more fluent statements when you're encoding that context. What about list? Uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, the context of list is that rather than one value, you have multiple. So it's non-determinism. It's like we're following all the different possible code paths. And you can imagine it has a, a type declaration, something like this. Because of the syntactic sugar of lists, I'm sure it isn't exactly like this. But we have a list of uh, some type A, and that can either be, as I've already mentioned, an empty list, or a value of that type A const onto the rest of the list of that type A. So how are we going to do return for lists? We'll take some A, and we want to return a list of A. Well, again, we can just use the constructor to construct a list of A. So, you know, we could have returned an empty list or a list that had three A's in it or anything else, but doing any of those things would be violating the monad laws because we wouldn't be um, giving back the minimal context that would still yield that value. So this is, in fact, the only correct way that we can implement this. And so, for example, we ran return list on the string bar. We're going to get a single element list with bar in it. What about bind? So now we want to take a list of A uh, an A to a list of B and return a list of B. So the context here we're talking about is multiple values. So we're not just be going to be able to apply this function once. We're going to have to apply it to every element in the list that's passed in. And one good way to do that is with fold R. So again, we're folding over a list. Uh, this is this time the list that's been passed in. And for every element in that list, we're simply applying the function F to it. And we're appending, that's what the two pluses are, are there, that's the function append, so that just takes two lists, joins them together. Because we need to uh, return not a list of lists, but one big list. So each time we get a result, we're appending it back to our accumulator to create one big list. So when we run it, something like this, so we, we couldn't make up our mind on which superhero name, we've got super, spider, and bar. We bind that to a function that adds man to the end, we get superman, spiderman, and barman. So there's our non-determinism at work. What about in Java? Again, it's going to take three slides this time. Um, so we've got bind, similar to how we had with maybe. It takes a function of A to a list of B and returns a list of B. I've also had to implement append and fold write in lists, which I'm not going to have time to show you, but um, just trust that they work the same way as I've shown you in Haskell. Uh, and also cons, which is that colon in Haskell. So it takes a value in a list, puts the value on the front of the list. For return, again, we're going to have constructors. So we've got a nice factory constructor here for empty lists and also what I've called item lists. So we take in a varargs parameter here. If there are no values passed in, we're going to return an empty list. Otherwise, this kind of ugly loop here is just walking backwards across those values and using cons to build up a new list. So trying to kind of mirror what we see in the Haskell. So actual concrete classes, empty list. When we try to bind on it, we're just going to get an empty list. And our item list is going to take in a value and a pointer to the rest of the list. And again, these are going to be immutable fields. And when we do our bind, we're going to do the same logic as what we saw in Haskell. We're going to fold right over the list. And for each element, we're going to apply the function to that value and then append it to the accumulator. So we're building up that list of results. So now we know what monads are and the costume they wear. But why would we use the, this? You know, what's this pattern good for? What pearls does it help us fight in our code? Well, in a general sense, as an abstraction, the perils that monads help us to combat are the same you might expect of any abstraction. Uh, we get uh, less code duplication. It helps us to hide away complexity so we don't need to deal with it. And in doing so, it gives us more maintainable code. More specifically, though, when people think about the benefits of monads, they often think about particular monads and what they offer. This pattern turns out to be really useful in a lot of cases. Uh, here are just a few examples of common monads and the heroic services that they offer. So a list monad, for example, can do many things at once, as we've already seen. And here are a few things, a uh, few, I guess, particular problems or areas that particular monads have been used to help with. And as you can see, there's plenty of practical stuff up, stuff up there. We've got like reading environment, config, parsing, logging, and doing all these things in a way that's consistent with the functional programming principles that I mentioned earlier. So the reason you might use this monad pattern is because there's a particular monad that achieves something that you're wanting to do in your code in an elegant and pure way. So let's have a look at a bit more of a real-world use case now of where we might use the maybe monad. 
And I'm gonna um, use a running example of a cash machine, so an ATM, a logic we might use to implement that. Uh, so to start off here, I've just defined a currency supply. So this is a list of tuples with uh, the key, if you wanna look at it as a key value pair, being the currency value, so 20, 50, and $100 respectively, and the value being the number of units of that currency in our machine, so five, 10, and one. And in order to be able to get values out of this, we're gonna use a built-in method called lookup. So it takes uh, some A, so that's the key, uh, and returns the maybe B. So, of course, a maybe in this case, because it's an operation that might fail. We might not find uh, that key in our list. So the function I've created here is called units left. So it takes one of these currency supplies, so a list of tuples into int, and a value that we're wanting to withdraw from the machine, and the number of units of that that we want, so five $20 notes, and it returns a maybe int. And that's the number of units that would be left in the machine if we withdrew that amount. Maybe though, because there's possibilities for fail failure here, two ways in fact. So here's how we're gonna implement it. We're gonna use that lookup function uh, to look into our currency supply. And of course, that might fail. The um, currency value we look up may not be there. And we're gonna bind the result of that to an anonymous function here, which takes the number of units that we got back, checks the difference. If it's less than zero, we're gonna return nothing, because you can't take, sensibly take more units than what are in the machine. Otherwise, we're gonna return the number of units that will be left back in our maybe context as per usual. So let's see how this looks. Let's say if we ran it uh, saying we wanted three $20 notes, we're gonna get back just two, because there were five in the machine that we passed in. However, if we said we wanted 10 $20 notes, we're gonna get a nothing, because there's no sensible way to withdraw that. Or if we said we wanted one $70 note, again, we're gonna get nothing. So I guess hopefully what I'm wanting you to see here is that this is handling failure elegantly at different points in this pipeline. And that's what's attractive about this pattern. And yes, we can also do this in Java. Uh, again, I've had to implement the built-in Haskell method, uh, look up and also create a tuple type. But given we've got those, so we take in our currency supply, our value and the number of units we want as before. And the logic is pretty much the same. We return a lookup uh, of the currency supply value bound to a little anonymous function which checks the difference and either returns nothing if it's less than zero or just however many units would remain. What about list? Uh, so one thing we might want to do if we had multiple currencies, uh, currency types in our machine is return a list of all the different notes that our machine has. And list is a good way of doing this because it's non-determinism. We can get all the different possibilities. So here I've got a function list notes. So it takes the amounts in our machine, so 20, 50, 100, the different currencies, so maybe Australian dollars, New Zealand dollars, US dollars. And so it takes the amounts and it binds them to an anonymous function. And here we've got an example of a nested bind. So we've got another lambda here, which is taking the currencies and binding that to an anonymous function. And on the innermost anonymous function there of the second anonymous function, we're taking the currency and appending it to show on the amount. Show is a bit like two strings. Um, amount is an integer. Um, so because of the closures, we're able to access both of those. And when we run it on something like this, say 20, 50, and 100, and the two currencies, we get the cross product. So again, you can see our non-determinism at work, we're getting all the different possibilities there. And yes, we can also do this in Java. Again, the same logic, just expressed differently. So we take a list of amounts, list of currencies, and we return the amounts bound to a lambda, which inside does another bind, and on the innermost, we just append the currency uh, to the string of the integer. So, this brings us to the final section of the presentation. So we know now that monads are a useful pattern, but what extra special abilities do they have? So to find out, we're gonna implement a function called sequence. So what sequence does is evaluates each action in a list or sequence and collects the results. So it has a type signature, something like this. So it takes a list, and again, this is pseudocode, a list of uh, some monads of type A, so maybe a maybe int from what we've seen, and returns a list, uh, of, sorry, a monad uh, containing a list of A. So that's the results after we've evaluated each thing in the input list. So before I get on to how we might implement something like this, let's quickly see how it might be useful. Uh, so using maybe, let's imagine we already had the sequence maybe function. Here's our currency supply from before, and here's a little function I've called check combo serviceable. 
So what it does is it takes in the currency supply in a machine and a combination of currency which we're wanting to withdraw, say one $50 note and one 20, returns us a maybe list of ints. So that's the number of units in the machine of each currency if we made that withdrawal. So here we're gonna use sequence maybe, which as I've told you needs to take a list of um, some monad A. In this case, that's gonna be a maybe int. How are we gonna build up uh, that list of maybe ints? We're gonna use folder yet again. Uh, so we take our combination and for each tuple, we're gonna call that units left function that we defined earlier, which gives us the number of units left for each one. Uh, so when we've built up that, we run our sequence on it and if any of those units left calls return to nothing, the whole thing is going to evaluate to nothing. So that's going to tell us that that particular combination is not serviceable given what's in our machine. So for example, if we uh, said we wanted one $20 note and 150, we're going to get just the list of four nine because we had five twenties and 10 fifties. But if we call this and said we wanted six twenties and 150, even though the 50 is okay, when we sequence this, it's going to see the nothing and the whole thing is going to evaluate to nothing. What about for list? Um, so one other thing you might want to do if you're creating a cash, machi cash machine is figure out what combination of notes to dispense given a particular amount. So the person wants $100, how do we dispense that given the currencies in our machine? So to help us do that, I've created this little function create value unit pairs. I'm not going to have time to go through how it's implemented, but this is what it does. So we pass in an amount, $70, and the currency value um, for one particular currency value, so in this case, $20 notes, and it's gonna give us a list of all the different pairings that could be possibly in the combination that dispenses that amount. So for $70, you can't possibly need any more than three $20 notes to dispense it, so it's gonna give us everything from zero $20 notes to three $20 notes. And now uh, the combinations functions. So this is going to use our sequence list function, which we don't have yet, but assume that we're, it's coming. Uh, so we need to build up a list of lists that's going to be sequence, and that list of lists is going to be lists like these create value unit pairs one. So we're going to go through each currency in our machine, 20, 50, and 100, and for the amount we're given, we're going to build up a list like this. And when we get our list of lists, sequence is going to give us all the combinations of taking one thing from each of those sublists. So it looks like this. So imagine we ran it on 70. When it's gonna get there, all the possible combinations of each of the different currencies for how we might dispense that value. Now, of course, there are lots of combinations here that are useless, they don't add up to 70. So we then need to filter this to find the valid combinations and we probably also wanna then use our check combo serviceable function to actually figure out if that particular combination uh, can be dispensed by a machine. Don't have time to show you all that code, but it is all on GitHub if you want to check it out later, and that is a fairly complete Im implementation of possible logic uh, for a cash machine. Of course, it's not a very efficient solution, as is probably obvious because of the use of non-determinism, but nonetheless, uh, it is doing something fairly real world. So that's how sequence might be useful. How are we going to implement it? Okay, so for maybe, uh, we're going to need a couple of other functions, map and lift2. And map and lift2 are actually fairly strongly related. Actually, sometimes people call map lift1. Uh, so map takes a function that takes some ordinary A and returns an ordinary B, and a maybe of some type A, and it manages to apply that function to give us a maybe of type B. Lift2 is similar, except we've got two arguments to the function. It takes a function that takes an A and a B, a maybe A and a maybe B, and somehow manages to apply it to give us a maybe C. Again, don't have time to go through the implementations of these, but here are some I prepared earlier, and I assure you they do work. You can check them out later. So what about sequence, maybe? So we want to take a list of maybes of some type A, remember that can be anything, an int, a string, or whatnot, and return a maybe list of A. So again, we're processing a list, we're going to use fold. It's one of the core techniques used in Haskell uh, instead of looping. So our accumulator starting value has to be the same as what we want returned. So rather than starting with uh, an empty list this time, we're going to uh, start with an empty list in the maybe context. And as we process each one of these maybes, really what we're wanting to do is take the value out of that and cons it onto our accumulator. But we're not dealing with ordinary values here, we're dealing with maybe values. So we need to do this within the maybe context. And that's what lift2 gives us. So we can take cons, which is indeed a function that takes two arguments and returns something, and we can lift it up into the maybe context so that it's operating now on maybes rather than regular values. Uh, 
And so when we do that, so let's say we had sequence maybe on list just four, just three, just seven. So as we're folding across from the right here, when we process that just seven, we're going to get the result of just seven cons onto, onto the empty list from our accumulator. Then moving across, as we go to the three, we're going to get just three cons onto that seven that was in our accumulator, and then just four. And finally, the final result, just the list of four, three, seven. But as you can see, even without going through the implementation, we've got a bind here in that lift too. So as we do this, we're taking into account that monadic context. And if any of those had been nothing, our final result will end up being nothing. What about for lists? Again, we're going to need map, which I've implemented for us already. We're going to need lift two, but now we need it to operate on lists rather than maybes. And our sequence is now going to take a list of lists and return a list of lists. So we already implemented lift two for maybe. What about if we take that implementation and just replace all the maybes there with lists? And yeah, believe it or not, that's going to work. What about sequence? So again, here's the sequence maybe that we just saw on the previous slide. So if we take all those maybes, so rather than lifting cons up into the maybe context, if we made that list and we said that our initial accumulator value is going to be in the list context, and yeah, believe it or not, that is going to work. So here, let's see it in action. Let's imagine we asked for $50. Here's the uh, list of lists we might get back in that case. So starting from the right with our fold R, so our first result, uh, uh, partial result we would get would be the 50 zero and the 51 cons down to the empty list from our accumulator. And then when we processed the sub list of 20s, here we can see our cross product emerging because this isn't just a regular cons, this is a cons lifted into the list context. So it's taking into account that non-determinism and giving us the combination of every one of those tuples cons onto every sublist from our accumulator. So our final result is going to look something like that, the cross products. So that was sequence and that was pretty useful and pretty cool. Or was it? Well, it wasn't that great. You're all programmers. What about the dry principle? What was all this business we were copying and pasting, changing things? That indicates that we're repeating logic. And it would be really good if we could get rid of that, wouldn't it? Well, unfortunately, we can't. <laughs> Not in Java or C Sharp or those languages anyway. But in languages that have higher order polymorphism or higher kinder types, like Scala and Haskell, we can. So I mentioned at the start of the talk type classes, which uh, define some kind of behavior, kind of like interfaces. So here's an example of Haskell's monad type class. And guess what behavior it defines? Yep, bind and return. So this is the way that Haskell writes bind. Uh, but instead of taking uh, a maybe or an int here, now we have a type variable, this monad m, where m has to be something that it itself takes a type argument, something like a list or a maybe. So to make something an instance of that class, you just have to show Haskell how it implements bind and return. And we already did that earlier. This is the same implementation, just now instead of calling it uh, maybe return and whatnot, we're using the standard. And exactly the same thing for list. Our implementation from earlier is going to work. Now why is this good? Well, now that function map we saw before, or fmap as it's more commonly known in Haskell, we can write like this. Now, instead of it being something that takes a maybe A and returns a maybe B or a list A and a list B, it can just take an M A, where M is any monad. We can put a monad constraint on this. And that means that we can define fmap once for all monads. And here it is. So this is an implementation. It only uses bind and return. So we can do it just once. Same for lift two. That same signature we saw before, but now instead of having maybes and lists in it, it's just got an M. And again, we can define it once for all monads. And yes, even sequence, which is itself defined in terms of uh, lift M2, as it's better known in Haskell here. So it all comes back to bind and return, which means we can define it once for everything. Isn't that great? No repetition of the logic. Well, you might not think that's exciting for three functions, but as it turns out, there are heaps of these, and they're like really basic programming building blocks, like things you see re-implemented over and over again, dozens and dozens of them, and you get them all for free when you make something an instance of the monad type class. So, you know, this is really cool. This is the big reveal, and this is why people often rave about monads. For very little work, just implementing binary return, you get a whole bunch of programming building blocks for free, which is very cool. So this is the monadic superpower. So what have we seen? So monads are a pattern. 
Uh, we've seen the context that they come from, uh, often prevalent in functional programming, but are in all styles of programming. We've seen the costume that they wear, the values that put, uh, the structures that put values in a computational context, and they implement bind and return. We've looked a little bit about why you might use them in general and why you might use specific monads, uh, list and maybe, and also just a few of the other problems you might be able to address with them, asynchronous computations, parsing and whatnot. And finally, we've seen the monadic superpower, that you implement this logic once and you get all this other logic for free. In some languages, you'll have to repeat it, but in languages of higher order polymorphism, you don't even need to do that. So I'll give the final word to Eric Kidd here. He says, once you understand monads, you start seeing them everywhere. The very general tools can be used to solve a wide variety of problems. As with any other abstraction, you don't need monads. They're just one superhero in your squad. But as one if one abstraction solves so many problems so elegantly, it's worth learning about. If you do want to learn more about monads, I've got a bunch of references here thing, uh, that you can check out to learn more. And as promised, uh, there's the GitHub link there. Feel free to check out the code, everything I've talked about, and more, and also a bunch of F-sharp examples that someone else has done up. And that's all I've got. Thank you.